Welcome to the Look It's Rock and Roll podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today I am solo because this episode's a little bit about me. I want to announce that this week, on December the 3rd, 2021, I'll finally be publishing Aerosmith on Tour, 1973 to 1985. It's a 612-page book, A4-sized, that covers the history on the road of Aerosmith in that period. And it's been a book that's been in work for, you know, quite a few years now, been delayed by COVID and being able to travel to New England to do some site stuff by uh, library shutting down, making interlibrary sharing of microfilm an impossibility, and also work and dealing with COVID. So I'm very happy after a couple of delays this year that it's finally going to be unleashed. It's certainly a book that has grown exponentially since I sent out some early proof copies to some folk for feedback just to see what they thought about where I was and whether I was on track heading in the right area after putting together all the research that had been sitting around in various forums for for many years. I mean, this project has been going for quite a long time, back to the early 2000s when I was working on KISS books. I'd constantly see Aerosmith stuff while going through newspapers, so I started, you know, compiling and stacking all that stuff because I love Aerosmith equally and I thought I might want to do something in the future if I had enough material. And then I got to a point where I'd done all the KISS stuff, I'd done Def Leppard, and uh, I started listening to more Aerosmith at that time and thought, yeah, I think now's the time to do something with it along the lines of what I've done with both of those other bands, but um, with everything I've learned from doing what I did with both of those bands. And all of my stuff's unofficial, unsanctioned, has nothing to do with the bands. I'm self-published. I use help, um, you know, privately for editing and whatnot, but I do everything myself. Layouts, um, photo work, um, touch-ups, editing of photos, licensing of photos. Uh, I'm really a one-person shop, though for this project I have had a lot of assistance for which I'm eternally grateful for. So the book, it's a paperback and it's only going to be available via Amazon.com because that's who I self-publish through. They are simply the facilitator. They will print and ship on demand orders as they come in if folks are interested in it. There's no guarantee that that is the case even after all these years of work. So uh, we shall see as reviews come out for it, hopefully in some of the uh, you know, larger media um, markets and, and whatnot. There should be a gold mine uh, feature on this very soon. So it, the book, again, it, it focuses on the touring history of Aerosmith 1973 to 85, and that's the general premise of it. It is not a strict biography because you know what some of the band members have written autobiographies you've got walk this way you've got a plethora of other books that have been done over the years you don't need to read all that again i know i certainly don't and i had no interest in writing a long form narrative of the band's history even though a lot of the very cool information that did come to light during interviews for this book and through the research for it are are very cool i wanted to weave my story about the band on the road, which is where the music is really proven. It's one thing to record in the studio, another to take it to the people, take it to the masses to see what the reaction is to the live performance. So that that was key to me. Why is it only 1973 to 85? Well, this is volume one. This is the classic area. This is the era that the vast majority of older fans are going to care about far more than what came later. I do have volume two which goes 85 to 2007, you know, sitting, needing, knocking into shape, um, you know, but it's not going to be a 612 page monster. I didn't want to commingle Columbia and Geffen errors. Um, so what I do include in it is, you know, the personal preference of 73 to 85. Do I cover pre-73? Yeah, it's in there, but it's very secondary because it's very patchy. There just isn't the documentation and whatnot. No one was keeping, you know, solid itineraries. Maybe the band is, maybe those have come out in something that they are working on for a completely 100% without a doubt accurate listing of all the shows that they did between 1970 and 72. I think I've had a pretty damn good crack at that. Um, We shall see and time will tell. And of course, people who were there living it, experiencing it may say, hey, 
you forgot this, you forgot that, you know, well, if I wasn't able to find it, I simply wasn't able to find it. And uh, that's why there are future printings always possible. Um, so size and scope is one thing. So we'll, we'll get a, a, along to that eventually. Again, it's not pure biography. Go buy Walk This Way, buy the, the autobiographies for that. I don't try and reinvent those. There's no point. I do try and confirm or correct some of the things that are presented in those works as historical fact or change, um, provide a little bit more context for those. And in some cases, I certainly do. I was able to go back and find dates that correlate with events that are very kind of sketchily presented in some of those books. So for me, as someone who is a historian, very fascinated to, to match those up. Again, as a reader or consumer, you're going to judge all of that by your own preferences and tastes and what you like to read. So again, if you're expecting full uh, biography, forget it. it it's, it's not like that, though you will see a little bit of that. I'll show you some of the book in a moment. One of the questions that comes up, are there photos? Yeah, there are. I've licensed quite a lot of photography from uh, professional photographers of the era. Some I wasn't able to, some I was able to do deals with. I have uh, enough photographs in there for me to be happy and more than satisfied with what I was able to do for this book. It's the most amount of ph photographic licensing I've ever done for one of my books. And I, I think the selection really does run the gamut of members and of tours featured. So. I, I hope that you'll enjoy those. Some you may have seen in publications before or maybe similar shots from the same shows. You know, so again, I pick the ones that appeal to me, regardless of whether I've seen them before and maybe a result of me having seen them before. So it's all black and white. I'm not able to do color, unfortunately. Number one, I think color is best left to the professionals and to the band. You know, when they tell their story and they use color, you're, you're, you're getting the full glorious picture of them. Number two, cost. It costs more to license a, um, a photograph for photographic use in a book in color than it does black and white. And it's strictly, I'm completely self-funded. So I don't have a fund. I don't do pre-sales. I don't do funding or anything. It's all out of my pocket before I ever put it on sale. So I can't afford it. And uh, it is as simple as that. And I hope that doesn't detract from someone's appreciation of the pictures. Because again, I have tried to select stuff that appeals to me within the context of where they appear. So all the photographs in there um, that are the professionally licensed ones other than ones I have taken of sites of, for myself are there for a specific reason, not because that's all I could afford, but because I liked those shots as well. So how's the book structured? Well, 612 pages requires a lot of structure and very basically it's built around reconstructing the band's touring itinerary through the period. That is in a nutcase how the structure goes. Each chapter starts with the discography. So the album that we are covering for that tour, even in the case of some of those albums not being completed at the time that the touring started, this is Aerosmith after all. So you'll get chart history. You get obviously an image of the cover, uh, the songwriting credits, corrected copyright details from the Library of Congress of data publication for these. And there's a lot of wiggle room with those in the 70s. It's not like uh, in the 80s and 90s when things were issued on a certain day in certain markets. And you could be a lot more specific about that. And those dates were actually listed in ads and whatnot. So um, let me take all that with a pinch. Um, I, again, I've used the, the copyright dates in most cases because that is the copyright date and that's a very best case regardless of whether they ship to stores were sold early or whatever it doesn't matter that's the date i'm using and i'm sticking to it so uh, you get the discography and then you get um, primarily american discography i'm not going to be a discogs and list 140 different releases for each album that would bore people to death and while there may be a market for that sort of book it's a collector's reference not what i'm doing so i'm using the major u.s releases the number of times it reissued say midline uh, reissues later with 24-bit mastering etc etc singles charts for the singles sales figures, RIA certification, sound scan, uh, what I'm able to determine without a sound scan account. Can't get that for some odd reason. Then it moves into reviews of the album itself. So what I want to 
make sure we have is a contemporaneous reaction to how those albums were received by the critical press at the time that they were released. Now, obviously, critics are not fans. And certainly, they are sometimes people with very large vocabularies who use their reviews as an exercise in expressing new words out of their thesaurus to impress or bore people or make a word count. So they don't necessarily uh, provide information or anything useful other than entertainment looking back at them and how Aerosmith were perceived critically at the time. There are also reviews from newspaper, um, press, music magazines and excerpts, you know, of, of all of those to combine to build up a better picture of the band at, at the time each album was released. So the narrative section, I think, is quite extensive enough to paint a picture of the recording of each album and the period in which the album and tour was born without becoming overbearing and uh, torturous to read. So I have tried to keep these to a minimum. I did have an ideal kind of word count. I wanted to keep them under in terms of essay format, which came first. So hopefully those will um, paint a picture of the creative process behind those albums and their recording. It's not a day-by-day -day studio log. Number one, those records aren't available. Number two, those would also be very turgid and boring, just like Get Back might be to some people who really don't need to know exactly what was going on and how many partial takes were done each day. That is interesting to know, but again, that's something if the band has the records, I'd much rather they put together an official book of that sort of things. I don't need to do it, and I also can't. So then taking up the bulk of the book, and that's the vast amount of page count, is the touring section for each album or tour, as the albums and tours aren't always named the same. It's day by day. It's an attempt to recreate the itineraries for the band in the period and to cull as many local reviews and local ads for each one of those shows and to confirm that it actually took place, wasn't moved, rained out, a venue changed, openers, closers, uh, attendances, whether they're noted by the press or reported in the trades, uh, gross figures, which are not very useful, but they're, they're kind of interesting to read about in terms of scale and the, you know, the ticket prices versus the capacity of the venues and you see the rise of Aerosmith. So uh, for consistency, I try to include those wherever possible. If I can't find a, uh, you know, attendance or anything, then I'll give you the capacity contemporaneously for that uh, facility. And hopefully I haven't missed too many in there. I did go off a 1976 trade guide for the majority of the uh, early shows. And then I've got some other uh, documentation that I've used for the Kiss books, uh, Def Leppard stuff for the later ones. And it's minutia. And that's where a lot of the interview quotes are going to come in with opening acts, uh, people in the industry, little bits and pieces that help flesh out the picture of Aerosmith's history. And I don't skip Joe Perry Project or Whitford St. Holmes. They are part of this story, even when they're away from Aerosmith. So I keep them in there. They, they've been on the chopping block now and then, but in the end I chopped on Ramirez and left that for the next uh, book instead. Um, I wanted Joe Perry Project in there particularly, and I couldn't do that and cut Whitford St. Holmes, that wouldn't be fair to Brad. So both of those are in there. And um, I know Cowboy Mock Bell's published his tour diary. Mine's different, mine's reviews, mine's set lists, mine's everything that is, um, generally not in his because he was on the road telling his story and do buy his book because it's absolutely fantastic. Um, as he was on this show to uh, promote it. It really is incredible, but I like to think that what I've done for the, you know, once a rocker side of things is useful to people who've enjoyed his book. And of course I do cover Joe from 79 to 84. And uh, there are some project picture photos in there as well that I purchased the copyrights for to include. So that's all in there. Finally, the book closes with a section on the historic post Geffen deal material released by Columbia. Because it's classic era, I don't want to include that um, linearly with the Geffen era because it is the original band in most cases except for the Crespo de Fe stuff. So, um, from Classics Live up through uh, Box of Fire, and uh, now we can even add in The Road Starts Here. That's where it ends. The Road Starts Here is the very last part, apart from the acknowledgments and everyone who's helped me, 
because The Road Starts Here is a great bookend when the very first chapter is called The Grind. And that is where the band starts out and where you get the back histories of all of the members, which you know. But again, in order to tell the story, it's all got to be in there because I want this work to stand on its own as a unified piece of product. And, you know, you're not going to find dirt. I don't do dirt or drama. I'm not interested in it. You can read the band members' autobiographies or other things for that. This is a celebration of the music. This is a celebration of the people making the music, the people who help put the band on the stage to perform the music, and the fans who consumed the music and enjoyed it and made Aerosmith an American icon. So I'll just give you a quick flip through of some of the book. Obviously, the cover art's been created by uh, who I think is a, a great illustrator, and I think he knocked it out of the park when he did this. Name's Chris Hoffman. You can look him up. He does do uh, these sorts of illustrations for for plenty of other bands. This is proof N minus three. I think I get the last proof today, which has four additional pages. But uh, I've got some shortcut post-its in here just to show you the, the main section. So. As you can see, and I don't want you to be able to see too clearly, discography page, that's the beginning of the uh, Toys in the Attic section. These are deliberately not going to be shown very well. Um, we then go into the narratives, which you can see is a hell of a lot of text. And that is the story. You will see some ads from trades for the albums. That's live bootleg, clearly. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. And uh, you'll see some of the tour section. And here's some of... Uh, Went up to the barn. Clearly had to. Shame I wasn't able to get in that day. But I'll be back. Uh, where are we now? So now we go forward. A little bit of Joe Perry project and photos. I loved Once a Rocker, by the way. That's why I went all out to get some photos of that. That was one of the first uh, cassettes I got when I really went hard into American rock. Uh, not being American. So, and then the, the final chapter. Chapter that I mentioned, which is, of course, the Columbia years continued. And then we do get to the very end, which is, if I can find, oh yeah, there's RIA certifications, a little chapter on that. The road starts here, there you go. And that was written before the album came out. Um, So that's why I'm waiting on the final proof. That was supposed to be it, but there you go. I've been doing editing right up to the very end. So what else is there? Well, release details. So December the 3rd, Amazon.com. It'll be available in the multiple Amazon affiliates internationally as well. Though there may be a little lag for the digital files making over to their print-on-demand facilitators locally. So hang, hang tight. It will be there. Uh, MSRP, I think, is, what, $35.99? can't remember. I tried to keep the price down as much as I could for these times. Uh, but again, 600 pages, if the thing weighs three and a half pounds, more than three and a half pounds, is A4 sized, is not easy to ship, is a pain in the ass to print, and I couldn't make it any smaller so the text would be more readable. I'm sure people say, well, you could have laid it out differently. Well, everyone's got their own opinions. I've laid it out the way I want it to be. Um, there is no ebook version planned. It's just not... Um, something that looks good in ebook format, and um, it may happen down the road when I have time to actually do it. But every time I do ebooks, it's a monstrous time sink. And I am working on volume two in another Kiss book, so and I got a job, so I uh, I'm not gonna you know, hold my breath on that happening. Get physical. Physical is really uh, you know so you can read it wherever you want as well. I know ebooks are useful. I've made this book as accurate as possible. It's been through a hell of a lot of proofing. It's been through a hell of a lot of commentary and line-by-line -line analysis um, by both grammar and um, copy editors and others. I've left in the reviews when they get Stephen's name wrong. I've left it. I'm not correcting it. I'm not changing the reviews other than noting some egregious uh, things. So I apologize in advance for that, Stephen. But uh, that, is, that is how it is. I've left those reviews uh, completely untouched. 
feedback. I more than welcome corrections, clarifications, comments. Um, feedback is positive and negative. Um, I hope people weigh it for the whole as a body of work and for what I have attempted to accomplish. Um, but again, you know, you're, you're spending your money, so you have every, every right to, to rant if so desired. Uh, who am I? I'm a fan. I'm not a professional in the industry. Um, I guess I've been paid to write before, so, but I don't think that makes me a professional. And I have been publishing, self-publishing books for uh, over 20 years now. So um, I've, I've done this because of a passion for music and for history and tying the music and the touring and everything that I missed out on together. So I'm overcompensating in a really excessive way and I admit it. So um, again, I've got like 17 books out on KISS. Or you know, a lot of them are now out of print, but I've done 17 and I've done two on Def Leppard, one of which is out of print. And it, it's, it's all the same sort of thing. And I, I have other ones that are sitting in folders for other bands that, that I love. But I, I can't do it for every band that I love. I only do it for the ones that I really adore. And uh, Aerosmith is one. The book ends with the road starts here. I do want to do a quick review of the road starts here, which is, of course, this year's Black Friday record store release uh, by the band. So it's been issued as both a limited edition 10,000 copy LP, which comes as a gatefold. Woohoo! and also as a cassette limited to 2,000 copies. I'll show and talk about this in a second. So it's an archival lo-fi recording attributed to 1971 using Joe Perry's two-track Will & Sack recorder. It's been called a rehearsal. It's been called, uh, you know, several things, uh, even live recording in some circles, but details are sparse. It could have been recorded in a rehearsal space. It could have been recorded while the band was setting up or hanging out waiting for a show after setting up. Or, and it could also have been multiple recordings, though. I think that's um, unlikely since it seems to be pretty unified in its sound quality and sound characteristics across. But I don't think that any of that matters it really is, you know, something that's 50 years old. So we shouldn't get hung up on the details about that as interesting as it would be to know the specifics and the exact parameters under which it was recorded. But it's just too fucking long ago um, to know all that stuff. So we have to sometimes just say thanks for the music. And, um, you know, it's circulated, I, I guess, in very tight circles previously and it's been now erroneously attributed all sorts of dates all pre-brad from what i've read and it's clearly brad the band says it's brad ray was asked in an interview for the book about it and stated flatly that it was brad and that it wasn't him because he never played major barbara so you know again 50 years ago. It was the 70s. Who knows? Um, but I, I, I think it's pretty clear that the band thinks it's Brad. And if Ray at that, thought, uh, at that time thought it was Brad, I'm happy to say that it's Brad. And, you know, the fact that he says that there are other shows that they did record with him, maybe some of those are going to surface one day. So if it's a compilation of various recordings, I don't care. It's 50 years old. And that's what really matters because I guess I'm okay if the mystery remains and I have no problem living without an answer for those specifics. Uh, the problem with the pre-release version was the nature of the two-track recording. As Mark Lehman, the band's everyman at the time, mentions in the liner notes, the recording is primitive, it's two-track. Um, without a mixing board on the raw source recording, one mic is ambient room, and the other is Stephen's vocal. Um, though there's a bit of uh, bleed through from the instrumentation because, come on, they played really, really loud. So none of that should be surprising. But you really, you do get good isolation on Stephen's vocal, and on the other track, you can play it mono, and 
just uh, basically here it as an instrumental. It doesn't pick up much of Steven at all. He, he's really low on that side. So that, that's interesting, but you're not going to get that on this. This has been cleaned up. It has been fixed. Um, it's been put through the, the, the transfer machine by professionals, and they, they've done an absolutely fantastic job in making it very pleasurable to listen to. There are some surprises on it for me, um, even having heard the previous source. Um, but one of the key points is it starts off with plenty of kind of noodling and it's background noises that you know you can hear all sorts of things going on in the background and a bit of uh, Peter Green's Albatross being performed that's uh, mentioned in the, the credits as well. Um, just, just not a, a full-on performance, just noodling on the guitar to it. But Stephen points out that that background noise could well be them in a club setting up for the evening or again, it could be in the uh, rehearsal space. I think Stephen makes a good observation there because the sounds of it really do kind of sound like a, you know, a bar or something after the band has done their load in, as limited as it may have been at the time, and are getting ready for a show and they've got some time to, you know, plug in a mic, a couple of mics, plug in the recorder and try and record. Uh, either as a lo-fi demo without having to pay to go into a studio, even a low two or four track you know, place at the time. It was some way for them to record and hear themselves. And perhaps they were doing that in a club so that they could hear how they actually sounded to that audience before the audience came in. As uh, is mentioned in the Aerosmith on Tour book, a lot that Stephen was very particular for knowing how he sounded and how all members of the band sounded in areas of a room, walking the room. So I, I think Stephen is probably spot on there. So whatever. You know, the previous version that, that was out there, or at least that I had, um, didn't have all of the intro kind of atmosphere going on. So there's an extra 90 seconds on this Record Store Day release. Um, so I, I say turn it up. That part, the intro, turn that up loud and listen because it's really fascinating. Uh, you're a freaking fly on the wall in 1971 and that is so awesome. You couldn't be there or if you couldn't be there in person at the time you weren't lucky enough to have been born. <laughs> I was, but I was on the other side of the world for all intents and purposes, you know, to get to experience that band in that embryonic stage is so cool. So LP packaging cover came with a sticker on wrap. I always take my stickers off because these are for me and I stick it on the cover. And uh, if this ever ends up for sale, it'll have an SOL or sticker on cover, SOC um, marking on it. It's on that low grade recycled paper which I am not a fan of. I hate this paper stock, but I love how it works within this context. So front cover, back cover is just your tracks and uh, other minor details. I was surprised that they did a gatefold. That was a really nice surprise. And it's got a lot of great photos from the era. Uh, some of these are already online and have been tarted up to, um, uh, to, to improve their appearance. But uh, again, there's some that I haven't seen. Some that you've seen, it looks like Kent Street, Breakfast. Um, you know, a great way to do a, a special release is to make it special. The LP itself, I've already put mine in archival. Um, I had no intention of ever playing it. So um, it comes with a, well, it com print comes with a printed inner dust sleeve, which is really cool, which is the actual real box that uh, Joe had duplicated that he tells you a story and it bums me out that he lists the apartment because I had that in the book and I thought that was going to be an exclusive and I had to go through all these Boston directories from 1971, 1772 trying to find the guys listed and I found Joey and Tom listed at apartment 22 of 1325 Commonwealth. So um, you get to see the box. I love that and uh, Mr. Perry indeed. So nice touch again for a record store day release. Even better touch is the liner notes. A double insert with lots of band member quotes. Mark Lehman's in there uh, telling the story of the formation of the band. It's by David Frick, uh, who writes for Rolling Stone or did back in the day. Um, very well done. Uh, Nitmuck is of course not in Upton, but uh, yeah, there we'll let that one slide. You get everything that you want in an informational package about that. And that's that's really what, to me, makes these things worthwhile, is when they're not just thrown out there with minimum effort. They've made a lot of effort for this package, 
and it really shows. So I'm, I'm very pleased with that aspect of it. But let's, let's get into the music. That's what counts. That's what everyone cares about. And that's what's really important. So somebody, that's Seminole Aerosmith. Um, you know, after that intro section, it kicks straight into that song. Five of the songs on this are going to get another year refinement before you, before being recorded for the debut album at Intermediate in October 72. So this song in this form says so much about Stephen and what he was already and saying as a writer, but equally from the go, the band is locked in and it's a great run through of it. That I'm just impressed by it. You know, Stephen's got the reputation of being a torturer, a drill sergeant for that era, but the work shows that these songs are vibrant. There's some minor lyrical changes in the verses on this version. It's not finished. It's very close. Um, you know, th there's a great line in there that somebody, someone who's close to me, someone to share my tea and biscuits with. The phrasing is not quite there um, uh, for, for, for parts of the songs, but it's mind-blowing bliss to be hearing that. And the first time I heard this, I was just grinning. The, the, the pleasure and joy of going back in the time machine 50 years and hearing this band at that early stage, somebody, that's great. And second track, oh, Briefer Head Woman. What can you say? It was there at the beginning. It would be there at the end for Joe. Night in the Ruts, prophetically, it would be uh, recorded when they needed material for that album, but the rawness here is glorious. So to hear it in both versions at both ends of the road is really, really cool. As is Walking the Dog, that's another cover, obviously that, you know, that was used for the first album. Um, but this version is loose and slinky, almost tullish with the percussion and some of the um, embellishments outside of your normal five piece instrumentation. So it's absolutely spectacular. I really enjoy that one as well. Into Moving Out. The first Tyler Perry collaboration. This is more fully fledged as a song, which isn't surprising compared to somebody or Mama Ken, because again, it's the first collaboration. So I think it's had a lot of woodshedding even at that early stage before Connolly comes into the picture. So it, it just it again shows how amazing this band was and how young they were and how young this song was at the time. Again, massive grin. Again, joy bliss you know it's it's the music it's full-on electric communion at the altar of rock and roll so uh, thank you so much for releasing this officially for everyone to be able to enjoy major barbara f follows up and you know what that's never been one of my favorite songs i i haven't liked it that much on classics live or you know the slightly altered version on pandora but but here but here, I guess I, it's got a more fitting context mixed in with this material and other embryonic Aerosmith songs so that it works, that it feels more comfortable to me, that it's like, oh, it makes sense now because here it is with its siblings. And here's, you know, obviously it's an early song that means much more to the band than the context that I got in 1986 when I first heard Classics Live. So... You know, what a difference 15 years makes, or 50 for that case. Um, Dream On. What do you say about Dream On? I mean, what more can be said about Dream On? But just to think that this is the song truly being born and making its transition from Stephen's head to the piano at 1325 or, you know, being played wherever they're playing it or however it's being performed now it's starting to take that form which has only grown over the decades both in terms of its reception its meaning its scope and everything but the genius the genius is absolutely obvious and that tag at the end is so utterly surprising that that blew my mind the first time i heard it i found it amazing stupendous so i hope if you haven't managed to pick up one of these that they do again Record Store Day first does mean that we will probably see it again in some form. Uh, and no doubt people will throw it all over the interwebs for you to be able to listen to. And I hope you get as much joy out of hearing that as I did. So it closes with Mama Kin. 
another of the core songs, and it's already in great form. The vocal phrasing on this one's the most awkward of all of those five songs that make the debut album. Uh, it's not quite there on the verses. The lyrics are all there. Um, you know, there's a couple of minor changes again that'll be made of refinements again in search of perfection. Stephen wouldn't rest with that is good enough until it was good enough in his head and it was on celluloid it wasn't done but this recording and the song itself is a reminder about how much thanks we owe mark Lehman. i mean utterly as that person responsible for so much who was so key to the band in 1970 into 71 um again you you really can't say enough about him and it's so great to read some of his comments in here and that's why in aerosmith on tour 1973 to 85 he is it's dedicated to mark as well as you know some of the other core people so um obviously i, I did pick up the cassette and the cassette is impressive i wanted that so i could do a digital rip of it um which i, I don't want the a, the analog sound of an lp they're not able to do quite the same with the packaging that they can for the uh, the LP, but they do a great job. You know, welcome back to the '80s. This was my format that I predominantly bought back then. There is a website that is uh, publicized in here that you can go to read the full uh, narrative liner notes, but. Um, uh, again, the cassette, the cassette is glorious. I did a, a really nice transfer of it and then sweetened it to my own ears. Not that there's any, you know, problem or fault with their mastering. It really is good. And just think of the thousands of times that they thrashed through these songs while they were perfecting them before October 1972 and showcasing some of this material, you know, for Lieber and Krebs at Max's and then later for Clive and, uh, you know, and others at the other assorted uh, showcases. Th these are the songs that tell the story of Aerosmith's birth. So the road starts here. And on Friday, December the 3rd, the road ends here for me, for this volume. And uh, hopefully, if you check it out, you enjoy. That's it. Thanks for your time.